With SRN News, I am Michael Harrington in Washington. Plans continue apace for a historic meeting of President Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says this is a big win for the administration. I believe that one of the reasons that Kim Jong-un is engaged in this conversation is that the pressure campaign that has been applied by President Trump and indeed by the world has put them in an even more tenuous, more difficult position. So I'm, I'm optimistic Um, We will work hard to see if we can't find a solution so that the North Korean people can, in fact, live a better life. He was a guest on ABC TV's This Week program. Pompeo was actually on the road today. He has arrived in Israel this morning for talks with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Ahead of Pompeo's arrival, Netanyahu said the talks would focus on, quote, Iran's growing aggression in the region and the upcoming U.S. decision on the international nuclear agreement with Iran. He called Pompeo, who advocates a hard line against Tehran, a true friend of Israel. There has been another big data breach. A student loan services company has notified 16,500 borrowers that files containing personal data were released to a business that wasn't authorized to receive them. In a letter to those affected, Access Group Education Lending says the data breach happened on March 23rd when one of its vendors sent out files including borrowers' names, driver's license numbers, and social security numbers, to another business. Keith Peters reporting. Michigan was very important in President Trump's 2016 victory in the presidential election, and he returned there last night for a campaign-style event. He said, quote, the rally was unreal. He felt the love, and he'll be back again. A trucker who was missing for four days in a snow-covered part of Oregon after his GPS sent him in the wrong direction Finally walked out to safety yesterday. 22-year-old Jacob Cartwright is fine. This is SRN News. Liberty University is preparing to welcome former President Jimmy Carter, who will deliver the commencement speech this year. Carter says, quote, I look forward to reaching out to this young generation of future leaders. I hope to inspire them as so many have inspired me throughout my life. Some are surprised that the conservative school would invite Carter, a Democrat with liberal religious opinions, But Liberty President Jerry Falwell Jr. says, quote, It's one of the greatest honors of my life to welcome President Carter to our commencement stage. I have tremendous respect for him as a statesman and a true Christian. A rare 6th century mosaic depicting the Apostle Andrew that was taken from a looted church in Cyprus breakaway north has been returned after 40 years. The head of the island nation's Orthodox Christian Church says the artistry that went into the mosaic, coupled with its rarity, makes the work a symbol of what he calls Cy- uh, Cyprus' stolen heritage. This is SRN News. Archaeologists say they've found evidence of the world's largest single incident of child sacrifice at a pre-Columbian site in northern Peru. Experts who led the excavation say the site contains the skeletons of 140 children. They were between the ages of 5 and 14 when they were ritually sacrificed during a ceremony the experts believe that happened about 550 years ago. The site is located near the city of Trujillo and was apparently built by the ancient Chimu Empire. Bob Agnew reporting. A cat that got loose at New York's Kennedy Airport has been captured after more than a week on the loose. WABC-TV reports that Pepper was lured out of hiding yesterday She bolted from her owner back on April 20th as they were preparing to board a flight to China. Cat's owner was moving to China for a new job and had to leave without Pepper. But the officer got a brainstorm, had a friend of Pepper's owner call the cat by her Chinese name. That brought him out yesterday, and Pepper will be on a plane soon. This is SRN News. You're watching Reuters TV. Here are your top stories. Pompeo signals a hard turn on Iran. The big push to loosen Washington's grip on banking. China's answer to Hollywood is officially opened. This is Reuters Now. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo arrived in Saudi Arabia on Saturday on a hastily arranged visit to the Middle East, just as the United States aims to muster support for new sanctions against Iran. 
The visit to Riyadh, Jerusalem, and Amman just two days after Pompeo was sworn in comes as President Donald Trump is set to decide whether to pull out of the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran that is still supported by European powers. Pompeo's senior policy advisor told reporters that their team is urging nations, including in Europe, to sanction anyone involved with Iran's missile program. The accord that limits Iran's nukes in order for sanctions relief does not cover its missile program. Trump has called it the worst deal ever. It's a bad deal. And threatened to reimpose sanctions unless Britain, France and Germany agree to fix it. Resuming sanctions would likely kill the deal. We cannot say we should get rid of it like that. In his visit to the States, French President Emmanuel Macron urged the U.S. not to kill the deal, but agreed a better deal could be struck. But with the deadline fast approaching, Pompeo told NATO foreign ministers on Friday that Trump had not decided whether to abandon the deal yet, but it was not likely he'd stick to it without substantial changes. The bill as amended is passed. It's been eight years since Congress passed the sweeping Wall Street bank reform known as Dodd-Frank following the financial crisis. But with a different president in the White House and the Republicans in charge of Congress, the financial services industry is pushing for the kind of looser regulation it's been dreaming of. Reuters senior financial regulation correspondent Michelle Price. They're really pushing for a much more aggressive set of uh, sweeping rule changes, which they hope will really be sustainable, you know, not just for the next two years, um, but, you know, into administrations in, in the future. They're looking really to kind of make changes and sow the seeds for a kind of completely different dynamic for, you know, the next generation. Some of the rules on their hit list go all the way back to the Civil War. Banks complain that too many rules are arcane, business stifling and money draining and see the Trump administration as the best chance to scrap them. The biggest bullseye is on a rule that requires reporting of any transaction above $10,000 in cash. And another dates back to a different period when banks were behaving badly. The Community Reinvestment Act is really about um, making sure that there's fair lending to poor communities. It was created in the 1970s as a response to so-called redlining, where um, you know low-income communities were highly correlated with ethnic minority communities. Regulators are expected to roll out proposals to get rid of that one and the others in the coming weeks. Congress is getting ready to pass the biggest financial deregulation bill in decades. Consumer advocates and progressive Democrats are gearing up for a fight, but it's going to be costly. Anti-regulation lobbyists spent $67 million around Capitol Hill last year alone and aren't likely to get cheap now. Fearing a possible midterm shakeup could weaken this bank-friendly Congress. Stormy Daniels' lawsuit against President Donald Trump's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, has been put on hold for 90 days. Earlier in the week, Cohen said he would assert his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination in connection with the civil lawsuit filed by Daniels, an adult film star. And on Friday, the federal judge in that case ordered the 90-day pause, saying that Cohen's constitutional rights could be endangered if the lawsuit proceeds while he's separately under criminal investigation adding that he's likely to be indicted in that case. Two weeks ago, the FBI raided Cohen's home, office, and hotel room. He and the federal government have indicated the criminal investigation and some seized documents relate to his $130,000 hush money payment to Daniels over her alleged affair with Trump, though the government probe's precise subject has not been publicly disclosed. Cohen said the payment to Daniels, Hi, everyone. whose real name is Stephanie Clifford, was legal, and Daniels has sued to end her non-disclosure agreement. Her lawyer, Michael Avenetti, promptly pledged to fight the stay on Twitter, though he did celebrate the fact that the judge implied Cohen would likely be indicted. How are you? Hi, Paul Davis. Paul Davis is running for Congress in Kansas. His campaign flyers don't mention his party, and he's unlikely to say unless you ask him. What he'll go out of his way to tell you is that he likes barbecue, dogs, Don't look at me with those eyes. and compromise. We've got to have people who are willing to uh, work with the other side. Paul Davis is a Democrat, one of many running in congressional districts long held by Republicans in this year's midterm elections. And if he wants to win his district, Davis needs the rural white voters who helped elect President Trump 
who won Kansas by almost 20 points in 2016. I'll shake your hand. How about that? On a recent Friday, Davis met a few Trump voters at a barbecue competition in Osage City. I'm sure that the vast, vast majority of people in that room were Republicans. Um, but, uh, you know, I had another gentleman that said to me, he said, well, you know, I'm a Republican, but uh, I vote for the person. And, uh, you know, and, and uh, I'm you know willing to consider voting for a Democrat. And, uh, you know, those are obviously the kind of people I want to talk to. The push for conservative voters is part of a broader strategic shift for the Democratic Party, says Reuters correspondent Jim Oliphant. For the first time in maybe a dozen years, the Democratic Party is recognizing the importance of white rural voters and actually making a conscious effort to chase after them. Now, that causes a rift with uh, the progressives in the Democratic Party. And in fact, one activist told Reuters that this is like chasing fool's gold, that that the Democratic Party has, has developed sort of an unhealthy obsession with getting back some of these Trump voters who are likely not going to vote Democrat, who are likely too conservative on issues such as abortion rights and gun rights to ever vote Democrat. One of Davis's own volunteers confronted him about one of those very issues. I've never heard him talk about abortion, and I know I'm going to get asked when I'm on the doorstep of houses. Where are you on abortion? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I tend to err on the side of letting individuals make those decisions. That's going to be, that's going to cost you with some, some conservative times. While Davis supports abortion rights, he sticks to talking points about jobs and the economy. Uh, what I call the kitchen table issues. But it's clear Davis has his work cut out for him. I'm Paul Davis. If a recent encounter with a Trump voter is any indication. Are you Republican? I'm a Democrat. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So, Have a good day, sir. All right. And then next thing I know, I seen a guy sitting on his window with a, a gun in his hand. And I'm like, you know, I ducked down. like. Okay. There's a battle going on in the streets of Detroit. And instead of using real bullets, the shooters are engaged in a so-called paintball war. Detroit police are warning citizens not to get involved. The city of Detroit is not the place to play paintball war. Now, anyone could have came up, anything could have happened, somebody could have mistaken these people for having real weapons and and maybe taking action against them. So what they're doing is dangerous. In order to combat actual gun violence, organizers have been using social media to stir things up by using the slogan, quote, paintballs up, guns down. But turning the entire city into a paintball playing field is a no-go. Police have arrested six and are vowing a crackdown. Responding to complaints is putting a strain on the system and diverting police attention from more serious crimes. According to a report released last year by the FBI, Detroit was the most violent big city in America. Thanks to social media, Paintball wars have already spread to cities like Atlanta and in Greensboro, North Carolina, and may have led to a death by a real gun. Three Palestinian protesters shot dead by Israeli troops along the Gaza border on Friday, just hours after the United Nations human rights chief criticized Israel for using excessive force against demonstrators. Thousands of Gaza residents have been staging protests at the border fence since March 30th. So far, Israeli troops have killed 41 Palestinians and wounded more than 5,000 others since the protests began. Gaza medical officials said that apart from the three deaths, more than 600 others were wounded in Friday's clashes, some critically. The Israeli military said some Gazans had tried to breach the border into Israel and that troops, quote, had operated in accordance with the rules of engagement. The protests have revived a long-standing demand for the right of return of Palestinian refugees to towns their families fled from or were driven out of when the state of Israel was created 70 years ago. The demonstrations also come at a time of growing frustration for Palestinians as chances for an independent Palestinian state look slim. Alfie Evans, the 23-month-old British boy whose grave illness drew international attention, has died. The toddler's father, Tom Evans, broke the news on Facebook, writing, My gladiator lay down his shield and gained his wings at 2.30. Absolutely heartbroken. Alfie had a rare degenerative disease and had been in a semi-vegetative state for more than a year. 
After a series of court cases, doctors at Alderhey Children's Hospital in Liverpool removed his life support nearly a week ago against his parents' wishes. They wanted to take him to Rome, where the Vatican's Bambino Gesù Hospital had offered to care for him. But on Wednesday, a British court rejected their appeal. Pope Francis had taken a personal interest in the case, tweeting after the boy's death that he was deeply moved and praying for Alfie's parents. British grocery retailers Sainsbury's and Walmart's Asda are in talks to create a supermarket behemoth. The two businesses confirmed on Saturday that they are in advanced negotiations to merge. They are the UK's second and third biggest supermarkets behind Tesco. But the combined company would leapfrog Tesco's market share, creating a business, according to one source, worth up to £15 billion or $20.7 billion. Britain's big grocers have been losing market share to German discounters Aldi and Lidl. Sainsbury's has reported profit declines for the past three years, and Asda for the past two. Indeed, Asda, which Walmart bought in 1999, is one of the retail giant's biggest and worst performing international businesses. Three sources familiar with the situation say Walmart is likely to keep a minority stake, thought to be around 40%. Sainsbury's has invited media and analysts to presentations on Monday, which could indicate a done deal. But the combination still needs to get past Britain's competition regulator, the Competition and Markets Authority, given that the deal could effectively create a duopoly. Lights, camera, action. China's movie industry has been given a major boost with the launch of Qingzhou Oriental Movie Metropolis. This sprawling studio complex in the northeast of the country covers an area equivalent to more than 200 football pitches. The group behind the development, China's Dalian Wanda, says it plans to turn the port city of Qingzhou into a global film production hub. It's filled an important gap in Chinese film history. It will boost the development of the Chinese movie industry and push Chinese film to the world stage. The $8 billion project was launched amid what some describe as a rough patch between China and Hollywood. A handful of high-profile US-China film ventures have fallen apart in recent years and Hollywood's share of the Chinese market is losing ground. Reuters' Adam Jordan is in Shanghai. Chinese films have really come come to the fore. We've seen a, you know, a drop in terms of the proportion that Hollywood films are taking of the box office here. I think it was around 45% back in 2013. That's dropped to around a quarter so far this year. What that means is that for Hollywood producers and Hollywood studios, China has become a, a more of a tricky proposition. That relationship is no longer quite in that golden period, but now a little bit more of a, a, a complicated prospect. Oriental partially opened in 2016, but so far the only major American movies to be produced there are legendary entertainments Pacific Rim Uprising and The Great Wall. Wanda previously said it aimed to host at least five to six Hollywood projects in its first year of full operation in 2018. You're up to date. Check back later as stories develop. CBC News, The World This Hour. Hello, I'm Kenny Sharp. Foreign Affairs Minister Christia Freeland and Special Envoy Bob Ray will visit Bangladesh this coming week. A UN delegation is on the ground right now, still investigating the plight of some 700,000 Rohingya refugees who fled from neighboring Myanmar. And now, the threat of monsoon rains linger. Joan Leishman reports. Thin, ragged men hold small, white paper signs urging for protection, pleading for justice, says Abdul Rahim. Uh, any solar in- investigation, our difficulties. <laughs> Makeshift shacks and tents cling to the hills as far as you can see. They hold 700,000 refugees who fled attacks by Myanmar's military and zealous Buddhists. The Muslim minority say they have faced torture, rape, and have been burned alive. Today, they'll ask the UN delegation to help help them leave the camps to return home safely and for justice. We must get a nationality. We also demand justice for the genocide which has happened in our country, just like Bosnia and Yugoslavia. The beginning of Bangladesh's monsoon season, which brings months of wild rains and cyclones. Aid agencies have been giving children identification bracelets in case they get lost or swept away by torrents of mud and water. Joan Leishman, CBC News, Toronto. Officials in Seoul say North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is pledging to close the country's nuclear test sites next month. 
State media says Pyongyang would suspend nuclear and missile tests as well as scrap nuclear test sites and instead pursue economic growth and peace. Reports say the North is also willing to invite experts and journalists from the U.S. and South Korea for transparency's sake. Bruce Bennett is a defense researcher with RAND Corporations. They're finally doing something rather than just making promises. And promises from North Korea historically haven't meant very much. They've not kept their promises. So for them to actually be prepared to do something in May, this is major. Kim also says his government will declare North Korea to adopt Seoul Standard Time, which is 30 minutes faster than Pyongyang time. Meantime, U.S. President Donald Trump was talking about North Korea last night. Thousands of supporters at a Michigan rally chanting Nobel, meaning he should get the Nobel Peace Prize. North Korea's sudden openness has surprised some observers. Trump emphasized, however, that he's not going to change his tactic. If we would have said where we are today from three or four months ago, remember they were saying, he's going to get us into nuclear war, they said. Nuclear. No, no, no. Strength is going to keep us out of nuclear war. Not going to get us in. The meeting between Trump and Kim Jong-un could happen over the next four to six weeks. Demonstrations are continuing this weekend against Nicaragua's embattled President Daniel Ortega. Marchers joined members of the Catholic Church for a protest walk that drew thousands to the capital of Mangua. The country's powerful Catholics have given Ortega an ultimatum. Whole talks within 30 days. Demonstrations began last month over cutbacks, but then exploded into anger over Ortega's authoritarian rule. His security forces have shot and killed as many as 60 protesters, wounding at least 100 others. Ortega's vice president, who is also his wife, calls protesters bloodsuckers and criminals. Back in this country, an unprecedented crowd expected to gather for a Toronto vigil this evening in the northern part of the city. Organizers of the event, which will remember the dead and injured from this week's deadly van attack, believe up to 25,000 people or more could attend. The Prime Minister, Ontario's Premier and Toronto's Mayor will also be there. The vigil will start with a procession at 5.30 Eastern, ahead of a ceremony featuring Indigenous drummers, faith speakers and choirs. CBC News Network will have live coverage of tonight's vigil beginning at 7 Eastern. You can also listen on CBC Radio 1 or head to our website for the live stream. That is Your World This Hour. For CBC News, I'm Kenny Sharp. Your NBC Sports Radio update starts now. Sharks, even the series in double overtime. I'm Pete Fox. After getting their clock cleaned on Thursday, 7 to nothing, the Sharks rebounded. They needed double overtime to get it done. 4-3 the final. Logan Couture had the game winner, his teammate Joe Pavelski. You know, but it always doesn't happen that way, you know, when when you're playing good. And, you know, so for us to finish it off, you know, catch a little break with goaltender interference, whether it's a break or not, but it's a call that... Obviously, turn the game for us and give us another opportunity. And I think that second overtime, we we came out. You know, we forced the issue a little bit. Team makes a great play trying to cut a seam there, grabs another penalty, um, and then fi- finally executed on that power play. In the other game, the Bruins a 6-2 win over the Lightning to grab a 1-0 series lead. Patrice Bergeron scored twice for Boston in the win. NBA hardwood. The Warriors cruise past the Pelicans, 123. 101 the final, 26 for Kevin Durant, 27 for Klay Thompson, including four threes. In the early game, wrapping up the first round, the Celtics improved to 20-4 and four at home and 23-8 and eight overall in Game 7 clinchers by beating the Bucks 112-96. Brad Stevens. You know, our guys did a great job. It was a hard-fought series and a hard-fought game, and, you know, any time that we were just a little bit off, they exposed us the draft is in the books terry quinn is now known as mr irrelevant wide receiver out of southern methodist taken 256 overall by the washington redskins baseball dodgers and giants split a double header in san francisco padres hammered the mets in san diego 12 to 2 and the yankees cruise past the angels in anaheim 11 to 1 i'm pete fox this is nbc sports radio 